want to make me a co-host in case others join later, I can let them in. If that would be helpful. Oops, just a minute. Um, I actually disabled the, the waiting room for now, Leanne, if that's okay. So if folks join, they'll just automatically come in. Okay, all right, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> wanted to make sure they weren't sitting out there. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely, okay. thank you. Totally fine. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my early learning team and I at the Maine DOE, along with the Governor's Office of Policy and Innovation, are excited to offer this informational meeting for those interested in the pre-K expansion grant opportunity for school year 2023-2024. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and offer some information now. Before we get too far down the road here, we would like to offer some uh, introductions. So I'm going to pull up some names and, and uh, folks on my team, as you see your name, if you could just unmute and introduce yourself, that would be great. Good morning, everyone. I'm Leanne Larson. I'm the director of the early learning team in the Department of Education, and that is where our public pre-K programming is based. And also, we are the team responsible for the oversight for this particular grant opportunity. Right. I'm Nicole Madour. I'm the early childhood specialist at the department. I work on the early learning team with Leanne as well. Um, and I am just assisting our team in uh, the oversight of this RFA. Hello, everyone. My name is Jane Kersling. I'm a contract grant specialist with the early learning team, and I also am the RFA coordinator for this pre-K expansion RFA. Good morning. I'm Suga Lant. I'm a distinguished educator working with the early learning team providing technical assistance to grant districts. Morning, everybody. I'm Marcy Whitcomb. I am the public pre-K consultant for the early learning team at the Department of Education. Good morning. Sure My name is... oh. All you um, need. I wasn't oh, sure if you were on yet. <laughs> My... Sorry. Um, I'm Nina Cunningham. I'm the Head Start State Collaboration Director. Um, I sit on the early learning team as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Hicks. I am a senior policy analyst and children's cabinet coordinator in the governor's office of policy innovation in the future. And I am here because pre-K expansion um, is a priority for the children's cabinet as well as the governor um, and part of the main jobs and recovery plan for the governor, including pre-K expansion and child care uh, infrastructure grants together are a priority for our governor. So I'm here for those reasons. So today's session will be recorded and then later posted at the following website. It's our early learning team site where we post resources um, for professional development and continued learning. So some quick important dates of which to be aware. Some have already passed, August 5th for one. Uh, this is the date that the RFA was released publicly. Here we are today, August 23rd, and this is our informational session for interested parties, and we plan to run today from 10 to noon. Looking ahead to September 22nd, this is the RFA question submittal deadline. So between now and then, any questions that you have um, during today's session, you can populate them in the chat box if you feel comfortable to do so. Or if you'd like, you can wait. Um, we ask that you wait until the end to unmute and ask questions out loud. Um, we do have folks on today that will be recording any and all questions. These will then be gathered um, together and into one document. And on September 30th, answers and responses to those questions will be posted publicly. And then of course, the big one, October 13th, is when the RFA submission deadline occurs. So I did just wanna back out of the PowerPoint for just a moment and show folks where you can access the RFA and where you'll find answers to questions posted publicly. And Jane is actually gonna put the link in the chat box as well. So if you'd like to follow along throughout today's session, then you can do so. So bear with me for just a moment as I switch over to here. 
So this is our Department of Administrative and Financial Services Division of Procurement Services site. Uh, this is where you'll find all of the grant RFPs and RFAs offered throughout the state of Maine, not just for the Department of Education. As you scroll down the page, pardon my scrolling for just a moment, you'll see access to all of the open RFAs available. And because this is directly related to the Department of Education, it's gonna fall under that heading. I'm trying to scroll fairly slow so that I don't make anybody wheezy. Here we go. So um, about a, almost halfway down the page, Department of Education, the first grant you'll come to is the Pre-K Expansion Grant. Um, so there is, you'll find a link here with the RFA number, the submission date, our grant coordinator, Jane, and, and um, access to her email. And then over here under miscellaneous files <clears throat> is where you'll find uh, right now one link. So the original RFA for this pre-K expansion in 23-24 has been developed and released here under the grant document. Since its release, we have had to make one edit and update and that has caused us to do an amendment to the original grant document. So the document that everyone will want to use for application purposes is the amendment number one. I'm gonna pause for just a second because I have another important piece to add to that. So amendment number one is the updated most recent application for pre-K expansion grant funding. Within the application, you'll find additional documents for budget purposes. The budget forms are still in the original grant document. So both of these links, grant document, RFA, and the number, as well as amendment number one, will need to be accessed if you're planning to submit an application. Once we have received all of the questions regarding this RFA and we've accumulated them into one document and provided responses, that will be linked here as well as a, a Q&A summary or frequently asked questions document. Um, so on and soon after our September 30th, you will find answers to qu common questions linked here. So I hope that that's somewhat clear. We do apologize for the confusion around that. Um, once the RFA is released, any, any changes and edits that happen um, have to be done through an amendment. So it's, bit out of our control in terms of ease of access. So we do hope that folks are able to um, find this okay and, and understand the discrepancy there. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on um, and just run through the application document uh, so that folks have a better understanding as to uh, what this is referring to and, and how to access um, and respond to some of the expectations there. So through this application, the DOE intends to provide grant funding to SAUs to increase the number of eligible four-year-olds attending high quality public pre-K programming. So below are some statutes that relate directly to this pre-K grant funding. This funding is provided through Maine's American Rescue Plan allocation. And SAUs may apply for the grant funding. Uh, the awards are for a one year period for school year 2023-24. So we're looking at, uh, uh, excuse me, we're looking ahead a whole year. The DOE does intend to offer, as funds are available, opportunities for SAUs to apply for grant funding that you can start or expand pre-K programming. So per statute, preference will be given to SAUs that are seeking to establish public pre-K programming for the first time, starting, uh, before awarding grants for expansion of programming. Additionally, competitive priority will be awarded based on the percentage of economically disadvantaged students served by the SAU. So funding may also be used to increase the amount of time that four-year-olds are attending public pre-K programming. Many of our 
pre-Ks that are already in existence offer part day or part week programming. Um, so districts could apply to expand that to full day or full week programming. Programs funded through these grants must be in compliance with the standards governing public pre-K programming, excuse me, programs in Maine. Um, and that is the, our DOE rule chapter 124. It's our basic approval standards for public preschool programs. So similar to chapter 125 for the K-12 grades, chapter 124 uh, really highlights program standards for the public pre-K space only. Uh, our early learning team highly encourages districts to access our DOE's pre-K guidebook. There's a visual here on, on the side of the cover. Um, this is a tool for supporting pre-K programming development. It can be found on our early childhood website under public preschool. And over on the right-hand side of that site, um, you'll see this image. You click right on the image um, and it's uh, the guidebook for you. So some other uh, things to be aware of, only eligible children can be supported by these pre-K expansion grant funds. So eligible children are defined as those who will be at least four years of age on or before October 15th of the current school year in which they are enrolled. All proposed general education pre-K classrooms should be inclusive of eligible four-year-olds, including those who are economically disadvantaged, have disabilities, and our English learners. Proposed costs should be reasonable and justifiable. SAUs will be required to do the following three things. You must document how proposed grant funding will be combined with allocations derived from your essential programs and services funding, your uh, EPS funding. SAUs must also address their demonstrated needs that the applicant SAU documents through a community needs assessment. Um, so a community needs assessment is something that is determined and done locally. Um, districts will often survey their communities to see what exactly is needed in terms of pre-K programming. Um, this will provide you with a better understanding of what families in your community are looking for in terms of services for their four-year-olds, if they are needing full day, full week um, education care, if they're needing before and after school care, if they would prefer part day care, um, anything like that, uh, we recommend be completed um, through a community needs assessment. Uh, we also ask that SAUs demonstrate how program sustainability will be achieved beyond the period of grant funding availability. So as I mentioned, this grant funding period is just for one school year, 23 to 24, um, and we want your program to be successful and of high quality after the fact. Um, so we do ask that any applicants uh, explain your plan to sustain the program's uh, high quality beyond the, the term of the grant. So applicant SAUs are encouraged to partner with licensed community providers and or other SAUs. So licensed community pro providers um, are, could be anybody in your community with a childcare license. So often, and in many cases, this might be a Head Start partner. There are also a variety of other licensed community providers such as um, childcare centers, family child care homes, boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, um, things of that nature. Public pre-K programs may be offered by SAUs on school grounds or at other facilities in your community. We're well aware that um, a large barrier for offering high quality public pre-K programs in schools is space. So if that is something that you can relate to and understand that you, you want to offer a program, but your school might not have a classroom space available, then we do encourage you to look at other facilities in your community that you could um, partner with or have a contract through to offer the classroom there. SAUs retain responsibility for setting and meeting all program goals for ensuring compliance with state and federal laws and rules as evidenced through monitoring and reporting, as well as maintaining fiscal controls and records. So all grant funding uh, will flow through the SAU, especially that's important to know if you have a community partner, um, all funding will still flow through the school district. 
the applicant SAU must serve in the capacity of the fiscal agent, which is what I was just explaining. <laughs> Okay, so some allowable expenses, costs associated with the following items um, could be considered um, under this grant funding. So you may consider purchasing equipment, materials and supplies that are necessary for operating high quality programs. So think of those sort of one time upfront costs. They're not gonna cost you money over the years, but rather purchasing them for the first time can be costly. Um, so certainly won't we wanna make sure that folks understand that this grant could pick that, uh, cover that for you. As well as costs associated with retrofitting classroom spaces. Um, so some schools need to add bathrooms, for example, or lower sink um, countertops, or add more lighting, or add a door, or, or things of that nature. So anything that um, is going to improve a classroom space to accommodate four-year-olds. Additionally, establishing or retrofitting outdoor playgrounds. The cost of leasing space for operating classrooms, like I mentioned a few slides ago, um, if you don't have space in your classroom and you're in your school, excuse me, and you're looking to operate in your community. Establishing outdoor learning spaces. Providing snacks and meals. Providing transportation for four-year-olds. Um, we do have further guidance in Appendix A. We also provide um, further guidance in our pre-K guidebook that I mentioned earlier as well. Um, transporting four-year-olds to public pre-K programs is not required. However, we understand that for many families, this is a necessity. So consideration of this um, certainly is encouraged and costs can cover, um, excuse me, grant funding can cover costs as necessary. Coordinating public pre-K programming, particularly in the case of programs operated in partnership with community providers, as well as providing professional learning related to the provision of high quality pre-K programming. Salary and benefits. So salary and benefits can, can be covered only for ed techs, education technician positions in districts that are starting full day, full week, pre-K pre programs and or that are expanding their current programs from part day to full day. So in other words, if you're applying to start a pre-K program, but your intention is to operate on a part day or part week schedule, then salary and benefits for ed techs will not be considered, um, will not be an appropriate coverage cost coverage for this grant. Um, it's only applicable to districts that are operating full day full week programming, and then only for the ed tech. We do encourage districts to reach out to Paula Gravel. Um, she is at our Department of Education for any SAU estimated rates. Oops. I'm gonna go back to that for just a second in case if anybody needs that um, email address. It's Paula B. Gravel at Maine.gov. So once you are um, accessing the RFA application, you'll find uh, around pages nine and 16 of the um, application packet, these tables. So the department um, is looking to award competitive priority points for proposals that meet some of the following criteria. One of those criteria areas is the level of economic disadvantage in your district. So the percentage of school population eligible for free and reduced lunch. If your school um, population for that eligibility falls less than 45%, then no pr competitive priority points will be awarded. If you fall between 45 and 60%, then you'll be awarded three points. And if your eligibility for free and reduced lunch falls more than 60%, then five points will be awarded. There are two other criteria that I'm going to go through as well. The second one is proposals that are seeking to provide more than the minimum of 10 hours per week of instructional programming. So our rule chapter 124 for public pre-K programs does require that programs operate a minimum of 10 hours a week. 
Certainly, there are um, examples of districts that operate more than 10 hours a week, more to a full day, full week schedule even. So below is our chart of how priority points will be awarded. So if you're looking to offer 10 to 14 hours a week, then no points will be awarded. Looking up to 15 to 19 hours per week, three points will be awarded. At least 20 hours per week, but less than full day, full week, then four points awarded. And those that are expanding to or starting programs that will operate full day, full week, five points will be awarded. And the third and final criteria area will be proposal seeking to establish a partnership with a licensed community provider. So if you're looking to start or expand a pre-K program with no partnership in place, then no points will be awarded. However, if you are looking to partner with a licensed community provider, then five points will be awarded. Okay, I'm gonna pass it over to Leanne now and she's gonna walk us through um, the next few slides uh, that are specific to the budget and uh, application. Thanks, Nicole. So the part that Nicole was just describing when she was walking through the various requirements of this grant, um, you may notice at the top of this slide, it says RFA instructions. When you open up that initial link for the RFA, the first, the document that's gonna open in front of you is the instructions document. And it will be really important to read through that thoroughly um, before you start to work on the application itself. When you are, reach the bottom of the instructions document, you will find the links for the actual application that will be submitted, as well as the budget table documents, which are a, a requirement to submit as well. And we're gonna walk through all of this in just a minute. Nicole pointed out this morning that we did have to make an amendment to the actual application document. So the one that you're gonna wanna use is the one that's now linked on the amendment link on that page that we referenced earlier. Um, we apologize for that um, confusion and um, hope that it will not make it too difficult. Um, so just make sure that you've opened all of the links, you have scrolled down, found all of the documents. And when the time comes um, to actually submit documents, it's the application and the budget tables that will all need to be included in your upload in order to have a scorable packet of completed materials. So within the packet, um, when you're working through your application, there are several sections that you will be filling in. The first is general information. Nicole, if you can, yep, thank you. Um, and we're gonna walk through all of these in just a minute. Um, so general information is first. The next section is about your needs assessment and community coordination. After that is the project overview. This is followed by the project description, which is probably the largest section of the application. And then finally, the budget, which includes both budget tables that you will be completing as well as a budget narrative. All right, so um, it will be important as you work through the application to have both the application document that you're filling in handy along with the instructions manual. And you will see that page numbers are often referenced in the application back to the instructions manual. And we strongly encourage you to make sure that you're reading through the instructions section when you're completing that piece of the application. That will help you to be certain that you are including all of the necessary information. The very first piece of the application packet is the general information section. And what's important to realize in this section is that although it is not going to obtain a score, it is scored as a pass fail. If there are any failures within this section, for instance, if a piece of it is not submitted or not completed, your application will not be scored at all. 
So make absolutely certain that when you submit this piece, it is fully completed because we would really not um, like to have to let you know that your application is not scorable because this section was not completed. This section, the general information section, includes the application cover pages and general assurances. It also includes a debarment performance and non-collusion certification. There is a reference within the cover page section and general assurances to sub-recipient award agreement, which you will find in Appendix A of the instructions. And then there is a section about partner listings with letters of intent from each partner. So I wanna talk briefly about each one of these pieces for just a moment. In the application cover page and general assurances, you will find some very basic assurances that need to be satisfied. And that will require signatures from the superintendent of the SAU, as well as the chairperson of the school board for your SAU. So please take note of that, that two signatures are required on those assurances. I'm hearing a little bit of background noise. I'm wondering, thinking it might be Amy Benham. Oops, not there. I think now she might be muted. Okay, thank you. Um, the debarment performance and non-collusion certification is the place that the SAU will substantiate that you are not debarred from doing business with the state of Maine um, and some other um, assurances there that are, are being offered just about your ability to actually apply for a grant. It's a pretty standard form um, that you are, I would imagine most school systems are used to completing with any grant that you're applying for. Um, as I mentioned, that sub recipient award agreement is noted in um, the application cover page and general assurances section. But if you want to know what's in there, it's a fairly lengthy appendix. Um, and that's the requirement of the use of the MJRP funds. So just take some time to take a look at that and realize um, you know, that that is something that you are agreeing to. Finally, if you are going to be submitting um, a proposal in which you will be partnering with a licensed community provider, you will need to submit um, a listing of those partners as well as a letter of intent from each partner. You only need to do this if you are going to be in partnership which we do encourage because that's a wonderful way of working um, collaboratively across your community and is often beneficial for families and children. Um, it, but it is not a requirement of the grant, um, but you do need to have that listing and the letter of intent from any um, partners who will be working with you to actually provide public pre-K programming. Um, I want to also qualify here that when we're talking about a partner, we're talking about an entity that will actually be working with you as a school system to provide the pre-K program. We're not talking about, um, for instance, um, if you were going to work with your local YMCA to maybe do one small piece of um, programming throughout the day, but if they were going to actually be running the program and um, you're providing them with your public dollars to be able to do that day in and day out in your community, that would be a partnership. That's certainly an area that folks may have questions about and we encourage those um, when we get to the end today or as part of um, the submission of questions. Thanks, Nicole. All right, the next part of the application that you will come to is the project overview. And the instructions for this can be found on page five. The project overview is significant for a couple of um, reasons. This is the opportunity for you 
um, to give an overview of the project's intended goals. And it is critical that in this section, you are explaining um, whether your project is intending to start a pre-K program for the first time in your um, community or in your SAU, um, whether or not you're expanding by adding classrooms, or if you are planning to expand by moving from part day, part week programming to full day, full week programming. You can hit those tabs if you want, Nicole, thank you. Um, the other piece of the project overview that um, you're gonna want to make sure you include is a clear description of the current status of pre-K in your SAU and um, an explanation of how you intend to either expand or increase enrollment. If you're starting a program for the first time, obviously you'll, you're gonna be saying that, but if you are looking to engage in an expansion through these dollars, you'll wanna explain what that increase is and give the um, committee that will be reading this a very thorough understanding of what it is you're intending to do. Um, that's very important because this explanation is gonna set them up to be able to better understand all of the other pieces that you're going to be writing about in the application. So the clearer you can be about the design of your project and its intended goals in this section, the stronger um, your application will be and the easier it will be for readers to be able to understand what you write about later. All right, the next section is the needs assessment and community coordination um, section. The instructions for this can be found on pages five and six of the RFA instruction um, document. This is the place where you will be describing the needs that your SAU has related to the provision of public pre-K. And it should be clear in this explanation of needs how the SAU went about identifying those needs and how it will reevaluate those on a regular basis. Additionally, within this section, several other factors should be evident. There should be demonstrated coordination between the SAU and other early childhood programs and agencies that serve children and families in the community so that you can show how this will, you will be maximizing the resources available. There needs to be evidence of consideration of the extended childcare needs of working parents. There needs to be evidence of provision of public notice regarding the proposal to the community being served, including the extent to which public notice has been disseminated broadly to other early childhood programs in the community. That's very critical. And finally, demonstrated coordination with child development services. One of the requirements within chapter 124 is that SAUs offering public pre-K must have a current MOU agreement in place with child development services. This is the place within your application that you will be able to explain how you will go about that or how you have been going about it if you already offer public pre-K. Um, ultimately, in this section, what you are um, working to accomplish is to build a case for how the proposed project will address the needs that you have identified and lead to better outcomes for children and families within your community. The next part is the project description. And the instructions for this section are on page six of the RFA instruction. Um, document. In this section, you will be um, describing several key pieces, the first of which is the high quality program design. And this description um, is not necessarily limited to what's going to follow as we walk down through um, the various pieces. 
um, but it at a minimum needs to include these pieces. The first of which is the number of additional students that you estimate that you will be serving, as well as the estimated number of classrooms and ratio of children to teachers per classroom. Chapter 124 has a ratio of one to eight, one teacher to eight students. So that should be reflected in your calculations. This section should also include description of the length of the school day and the number of days students will attend per week. Additional Leanne froze for just a moment. She'll be right back. I promise. If you just want to repeat that third bullet, Leanne, that would be great. Oh, sorry, Nicole. Did my internet drop? Sorry. You did, but it was okay. right at the beginning of that third bullet. So we'll just start okay. back right there. <laughs> Let's start again. <laughs> sorry about that, folks. Okay. So. Um, this section will also include description of where your program will be housed, whether it is a space that you will be leasing um, for the provision of um, public pre-K, or if you're going to be using space within one of your own school buildings, or perhaps you are going to be um, either leasing space through a licensed child care provider or in partnership with a licensed child care provider or community provider. Um, but some description is required here so that we understand how that will um, fulfill the requirements that you will find in chapter 124 about space. This section is also the place that you will describe the evidence-based curriculum and assessment system that you will be utilizing in your program that aligns with Maine's early learning and development standards. Or if you do not know that information yet, if you have not selected those pieces yet, you can describe how you will make those decisions prior to opening your program. You will describe the multi-tiered system of support that will be in place within your school, um, excuse me, within your program in order to provide additional layers of support to students who may need more um, beyond just the core instruction and your plans for inclusion or inclusionary practices. This is where you will include the plan for staffing, both in terms of ratios, but also the required credentials that are outlined in chapter 124. This is where you will describe the professional learning that will be in place to support both the pre-K instructional staff as well as administrators. This is the place to provide an explanation of how um, you will be handling oversight for pre-K programming, both the coordination of it and the management of the programming family engagement strategies that will be incorporated, including how families will be informed about their students' progress should be included in this description. And finally, any transition strategies that will be utilized both as students are entering your pre-K program and as they are exiting the program. The next section of the project description and the um, instructions for these sections can be found on pages five through eight, include description of partnerships. Partnerships as noted previously um, are optional in the application, but strongly encouraged, especially when it would be in the best interest of your community to consider those partnerships, um, especially for support for children and families. Your description in that section um, will be very important in terms of um, explaining what's the nature of the collaboration between your SAU and your partner. So what will the SAU be responsible for? What will the partner be responsible for? And 
how will that partnership serve to accomplish the outcomes or goals of the programming? We will would also strongly encourage that you reference the appendix in the um, that you'll see noted in the RFA instructions about partnerships, as well as some other resources that are referenced um, that will help you to build understanding about partnerships. The next section of the project description is designed to um, help you describe what your strategies will be for recruiting and enrolling students in your program. Um, what's critical um, to pay attention to in this section, um, in addition to the recruitment strategies that you plan to employ, um, will be what's the enrollment plan if you're not going to be operating a program that is considered universal. And by universal, we mean that you're able to serve any four-year-old in your catchment area that is interested in attending um, pre-K. We recognize that often um, SAU programs are not equipped to serve every four-year-old that might be interested in the programming. And it's important that you have thought this through and have a plan, um, either a procedure or policy outlined and in place. And that is one that should be demonstrating in, um, inclusive practices. The department strongly recommends that SAUs try to design a policy that is reflective of the demographics within your community. Um, whenever possible, it should mirror what your K-12 population looks like. This section, the project description will also necessitate an evaluation plan. How will you as the SAU evaluate both the implementation and effectiveness of your public pre-K program? And that plan should include methods for collecting information that will be useful both to program development and to ongoing improvement. And then finally, this section um, includes a plan for sustainability. So how um, does your SAU, and if you're in partnership, um, your partner would be included in this, how will you sustain the pre-K programming once it's started or expanded? Okay, so, the final part of the application is the budget section. And this also has a number of components to it. We're gonna start by walking through some basic um, pieces that are requirements of developing your budget. Then we're gonna look at the budget documents so that you will understand what they are um, asking for. And then finally, we're gonna take a few minutes to look at an example budget which is also provided as a resource um, to help you as you're developing those um, pieces of your application. So the first thing to keep in mind is that the budget should include all of the overall projected expenses for your proposed project. Your budget, um, should be focusing on um, either the startup costs, well, both of these pieces, the startup costs um, associated with your program um, and the project that you, you have outlined and or the expansion of your programming. But it should include only allowable costs under the grant program. And we'll be walking through those once again in a few minutes. Um, those costs should be reasonable and justifiable and should always be um, working towards achievement of high quality programming that meets the program standards. All of the project budget worksheets should be completed and included um, as part of your application packet. And in places where descriptions are being asked for, those descriptions should explain how projected costs were determined. There is a space that you will see in a moment where the estimated number of students to be served in the proposed project must be provided. That's essential and very helpful to 
the budget review, excuse me, the um, RFA review team to understand. And then finally, the estimated state local allocation funding amount, as well as any other sources of revenue that you intend to couple um, with your state local allocation need to be included um, so that you can determine how much um, funding will be allowable, as well as to help um, us better understand how you will support sustainability moving forward. And then <clears throat> this piece is absolutely critical and essential <laughs> to your proposal being read and scored. The estimated state local allocation for student figures must be obtained by contacting Paula Gravel at the Department of Education. Paula is currently the acting um, director of school finance. And when you reach out to her, she will help you to determine what that figure is based on the number of students in your proposed project. That state local allocation figure that you're going to be given is an estimate. That estimate will include both the state contribution per student as well as an adjusted local allocation. That adjusted local allocation is designed to reduce the amount of local support that you would ordinarily be expected to provide for pre-K students. And that's being done to help um, make it easier for communities to be able to get programs either off the ground or expanded. That reduction of the local allocation um, will be at least um, a 50% reduction. It may be more, and that just depends upon um, the amount that the state's normal share is. So it won't be less than 50% of the local um, amount that you would have been expected that that would be reduced. It's essential that you reach to Paula to get that figure because as you'll see in a few minutes, that figure is going to get plugged into one of the budget tables. And without an accurate figure there, it will be very difficult to be able to determine if what you've laid out in your budget is actually reasonable and appropriate for the cost that you have um, substantiated. So we'll walk through that um, in a couple of ways, both in looking at the documents and then looking at an example. Okay. So there are three budget tables that you will be completing. The first of which is the space in which you are going to be providing some key information about the total number of students in your proposed project and the number of new classroom spaces. So in the first section, um, in the total number of students, that's however many students apply to the project that you are proposing. And to figure that out, you are going to need to think about how many new students you might be enrolling in either part-time programming or the estimated number of new students that you will be enrolling in full day, full week programming and or the estimated number of students that might be shifting from part-time to full-time programming. So for example, you might have a project where you have been running um, a part-time, um, part-day programming, maybe a morning session and an afternoon session, but in your proposed project, you're planning to move those students to full-time, full-day, full-week programming, and you might be adding another classroom of full day, full week programming. So you'll want to think about all of that as you are filling um, in these tables so that we have a good idea of how many students you are serving. Additionally, we need to know how many new classroom spaces you will be outfitting. 
So if you're starting a program for the first time, however many classrooms you're planning to start, you'll be outfitting that number of classrooms. But if you are shifting um, or expanding classrooms, that number could vary. You may already have some outfitted classrooms, but you need to add more classroom space. So this is the place to record that. Budget table two is where you are going to actually be mapping out the overall project budget. This is where you will be determining what are all of the association, associated costs with the project that you are proposing. And you will be providing the budgeted amount as well as an explanation of those expenses. And this is where um, it's really important to explain how did you come up with what you are budgeting? How did you figure out what that cost was going to be and providing evidence that helps to explain that? That can be provided in um, the boxes that will expand under the explanation of expenses section. If you need to provide more detail, for this section, you could also include that in your budget narrative, which is another piece of the actual application document. Once you have um, determined all of those budget costs, you will come up with a total amount for your budget. And um, that is located about two thirds of the way down on this budget table. You'll see the space for that. Once you have done that, then you're going to fill in that estimated state local allocation figure that you will have received by working with Paula Gravel. That amount is going to be automatically subtracted from the total budget amount. Additionally, if there's any other federal funding that you're planning to commit to your project, you would fill that in. That will also be subtracted out. And then if your partner is planning to provide any funding support, you would fill in what that amount is and that will also be subtracted. What's remaining is the amount that you can actually request in expansion grant funding. Once you have that amount, then you're gonna to wanna to move on to table three. And this is where you will be mapping out how each of the different budgetary sources are going to cover your expenses. Nicole, would you mind moving us on to table three? Thanks. Okay, so in table three, you will see several columns situated beside the various budget categories. All of these categories are the same ones you saw in table two. But on table three, what you're gonna be mapping out is how much um, or how you're going to divide up the amount that you're required to commit from state and local allocation, from any federal funds that you may have committed, any additional federal funds, any partner contributions, and then how you would use the amount that's available to you through the expansion grant. Once you've completed budget table two, the totals that you indicated there for each of these columns will be pre-populated for you down in this very bottom row. That's helpful because as you start to fill in the various costs that you came up with, it will keep a running total. And what you should be aiming for is to make sure that whatever um, state local allocation was from budget table two, the costs that you've associated um, in this column should come up to that total. And the same thing for each one of these columns. Okay, this will make a little more sense probably in a moment when we look at an example. A couple other things I wanna point out on budget table three. Nicole mentioned earlier that um, there are a couple of cost categories that are not allowable for use with pre-K expansion grant funding. One of those is the salary and benefits for teachers. 
Um, that is not an allowable expense. So that's why that's blacked out there because that will have to be paid for out of other budgetary sources. The cost for education technicians can be funded through expansion grant funds if it is a full day, full week program. So if that is part of your proposed project, then you would be able to attribute some of that funding to that um, particular budget category. Indirect costs are not an allowable expense for the pre-K grant expansion funds. You may have indirect costs in your proposal, but they will have to be funded out of the other sources of funding, not the pre-K expansion grant. Okay, we are gonna move on now and look at an example, because I think that will make this much easier to understand. Oh, and thanks, Marcy, I appreciate that. I noticed that as I was looking at it, Marcy put in the chat box that Paula Gravel's correct email does have an initial letter B in the middle of it. Paula.b.gravel at main.gov. Okay, so let's um, take a look at this example of a project and how this would play out across budget tables one, two, and three. So, this is an example of a project in which a school system is currently operating one classroom of public pre-k in a part day model so they have one a.m classroom and one p.m classroom 16 students in both 16 in the a.m and 16 in the p.m and with the grant funding what the sau would like to do is expand to three full day, full week classrooms. So in actuality, what they wanna do is to take their part day classrooms and make each of those full day. So that would be um, shifting 32 students to full day, full week. That would constitute two full day classrooms. And then they wanna add an additional 16 students in a third classroom. So their project is encompassing 48 students total. 16 of those are new students that are going to be enrolled in full day, full week programming. And 32 of those students are going to be shifting from part day or part time programming into full day, full week programming. So when working with Paula Gravel to figure out what the state local allocation is, it would be important for her to know that this project is encompassing 48 students. That's what the estimate will be based upon. Additionally, this is a project that would be looking to outfit two new classroom spaces because this was an SAU that already had one classroom space that was operating part-time programming, they're gonna be looking to outfit two additional classrooms in order to be able to have three full day, full week classrooms. Okay. All right, now let's move on to budget table two and see how this would play out. So the school system, has populated what those budgeted amounts are to operate the project that encompasses three full day, full week classrooms of, with 16 students in each classroom. So they are anticipating that they will need three teaching positions, three lead teachers, three ed techs. They're going to need instructional materials and supplies to outfit two additional classrooms. They are going to need some um, additional equipment in order to outfit those two new classrooms. They are seeking to expand and enhance their playground equipment, knowing that they're going to have more students attending their program. They are anticipating that they're gonna to have to do some retrofitting of the classroom spaces that they intend to use in order to make them 
um, meet the requirements of chapter 124. In this particular example, they already have classroom space available in their building, so they're not going to need to lease the space. So there's no cost populated there, although there could be, depending on the project. They have um, calculated the costs of meal and snack provision. They are planning to provide transportation and are looking to um, outfit 16 bus seats with re safety restraints and harnesses. They are going to be um, providing professional development for their educators. They are going to be um, providing a pre-K administrator salary and benefits at, at um, a cost of $15,000. All of those expenditures add up to a total requested budget of 653,000 approximately. Once they have obtained what the state local allocation amount is from the Department of Finance, so that's that email to Paula Gravel, that totals up to um, just over $248,000. So that figure gets populated here. In this particular example, they are anticipating that their reimbursement through USA, USDA is going to cover the costs of the snack and meal provision. So they have accounted for that here and that will be removed from the overall cost. And then they are also proposing working with a partner that's going to be contributing $75,000 to the project. So the state local allocation, the federal fund, additional federal funding and the additional partner funding, that will all be subtracted out of the overall budget costs. And that leaves an amount of just over $271,000 that can be sought in pre-K expansion grant funding. Okay, once that's been determined, you're gonna go on to budget table three. And budget table three will pre-populate for you those totals from budget table two. So those numbers that we just saw are now sitting down here. And what the applicant needed to do in this section was determine how they're going to allocate these various sources of funding across the different budget categories. So what they have um, chosen to do is to put their state local allocation amount into the teacher salary. They're also going to be drawing some of the funding from their partner to help support the teacher funding. But the education technician funding, some of that's going to be allocated toward their expansion grant request, and some of it's going to be paid for by their partner. In this case, they are going to pay for all of the instructional materials, equipment, playground equipment, and the retrofitting out of their expansion grant. As you saw before, the meal snack provision is coming out of other federal funds that are available to them. Transportation costs, professional development, and coordination of programming is also being paid for out of the expansion grant. So all of those costs add up to what um, you saw back on budget table two. So those figures from table two should match ideally what you and how you end up breaking up your costs in budget table three. Okay, I'm going to shift things over now to Jane Kersling, who's gonna take us through the rest of um, the pieces of information you need to know. And then we'll be at the point where we can take questions. Great, so who is eligible to submit bids and awards for this RFA? Um, and you can find this 
information on the RFA instructions on page 10. All main school administrative units as defined by 20 AMRS 126 are eligible to submit bids in response to this RFA. The, the department does anticipate making multiple awards as a result of this request for applications. The number and size of awards will depend on the number of proposals received and available funds. Issuance of this RFA in no way constitutes a commitment by the state of Maine to make grant awards. And award sizes are estimated to range between 20,000 and 500,000. Applications will be evaluated after the due date, and a selection package will be posted to the Division of Procurement Services website that we showed you earlier. Award amounts and approved grant requests will be finalized in February of 2023 once EPS allocations are finalized. And Finally, all proposals that meet a combined score of 65 or more points for criteria two and criteria three will be considered eligible for funding as it is available. The department re reserves the right to issue partial awards as well. So for appeals, when you submit in an application and you'd like to make an appeal based on the decision that you receive, you can appeal that decision. So the process for that is um, any person aggrieved by the award decision that results from this RFA may appeal the decision to the director of the Bureau of General Services in the manner prescribed as you can read the rest of that below. And the appeal must be in writing and filed within 15 calendar days of receipt of notification of the contract award. And you can see there where that appeal must be sent to. statutes and you can also find these on RFA your RFA instructions on page 10 the pre-k expansion grants are authorized under title 20a part 3 and you can see the link for that right here and the pre-k expansion grants are also included in the priorities as described in the initiative contained in public law 2021 Chapter 483, Part R, Section 2. You can also see the link right there for that statute. So if you have questions that you'd like to submit about the RFA, I'm going to go over the process. And you can also find information on this and your RFA instructions on pages 11 and 12. So any questions that you might have about this RFA must be submitted by email to the grant coordinator, myself, by September 22nd, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. local time, which is Eastern, to my email at jane.kersling at main.gov. And this is also very important. Submitted questions must include the subject line with the RFA number, which is 20220706, and then questions after that. The department assumes no liability for assuring accurate, complete, on-time email transmission and receipt. Then uh, for the question and answer summary, 
Responses to all questions will be compiled in writing and posted on the following website on September 30th. You can see the link right there. It is the responsibility of all interested parties to go to this website to obtain a copy of the question and answer summary. And only those answers issued in writing on this website will be considered binding. So if you need an amendment to the RFA, you can find information on that in the RFA instructions, page 11. Or if there are amendments made to the RFA, excuse me. All amendments, if any, released in regard to the RFA will be posted on the following website that we showed you before. It is the responsibility of all interested parties to go to this website to obtain amendments. Only those amendments posted on this website are considered binding and amendments must be posted seven days before proposals are due. So just a reminder, there was one amendment made to this RFA that is now posted. So when you're ready to submit your application, you can refer to the instructions on page 12 of your RFA instructions. Applications must be received by October 13th, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. local time. Any applications received after that 11.59 p.m. deadline will be ineligible for award consideration for that annual application enrollment period. So it is absolutely imperative to um, make that date if you plan to apply. Submission instructions. Applications are to be submitted to the State of Maine Division of Procurement Services via email to proposals at maine.gov. Only applications received by email will be considered. And once again, as I said earlier, the department assumes no liability for assuring accurate, complete email transmission and receipt. Emails containing links to file sharing sites or online file repositories will not be accepted as submissions. Only email applications that have the actual requested files attached will be accepted. Encrypted emails received, which require opening attachments and logging into a propri proprietary system will not be accepted as submissions. And just something to keep in mind, file size limits are 25 megabytes per email. Applicants may submit files separately across multiple emails as necessary due to file size concerns. All emails and files must be received by the due date and time listed above. Applicants are to insert the following into the subject line of their email submission. RFA number, and that's the RFA number coinciding with this RFA, application submission, and then the name of the applicant. Applications are to be submitted as a single typed PDF or Word file and must include the application and budget found on page 18 of the RFA instructions document. So this is what the scoring weights and process chart looks like. And you can find this on your RFA instructions on pages 13 through 17. The grant review team uses a consensus approach to evaluate and score all sections listed below. Members of the review team will not score those sections individually, but instead will arrive at a consensus as to assignment of points for each of those sections. And just going over this once more, there is um, several di different criteria. Criteria A is the general information, which is pass or fail. You're gonna wanna make sure to have your application cover page and general assurances in there. 
the Depar Department Performance and Non-Collusion Certification. And if you are going to have a partner, you're going to want to list um, letters of intent from each partner for this criteria to be complete. Criteria B includes all the specifications of work to be performed, and that's at, a, at 60 points total for this criteria. You'll have your needs assessment and community coordination, project overview that Leanne went over earlier, project description, high quality program design, recruitment and enrollment, evaluation, and sustainability for your program. Criteria C are all the budget forms and budget narratives that we talked about earlier. That is at 25 points. That will include your budget narrative and budget forms and a capacity for success and sustainability. Criteria D are priority points, and that's at a total of 15 points, which will include the level of economic disadvantage, partnership with community providers, and full day, full week programming from the charts Nicole went over earlier. And appendices. In your RFA application, you can find Appendix A on page 18. That is the sample subaward agreement that you can look over that is necessary because of the MJRP funding. Appendix B is a transportation guidance. If you um, need some support or some information on providing transportation for your program, that is a great resource to check out. That is on page 18. Appendix C is the public pre-K partnerships guidance. And additional resources that might be of use. Um, here's the link to the RFA. And you can see the link below that is the actual live document. And just another reminder, there is an amendment. So um, make sure that you download that as well when you're going to download your RFA. Also, you can find the pre-K guidebook at this link right here. And in the another resource is the pre-K section of the Early Childhood website, and the link is right at the bottom there. So now we are to the question portion of our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? You're welcome to either come off of mute and ask a question or pop a question into the chat box. And Nicole, I'm wondering if we could stop screen sharing and that would make it just easier for people to see one another. I'm hoping that <laughs> lack of questions means that everybody's feeling pretty comfortable and clear with all of the instructions. But we certainly want to encourage you if there's anything that you would like to ask, this is a great time to do it. Obviously, you still have plenty of time before the September 22nd deadline to submit questions in writing to Jane Persling at maine.gov. But we're more than happy if we can answer something now to make it more, more helpful. Oops. 
Kathleen, I see you've got a question. Can you give examples of partnerships? Sure, we can definitely do that. Nicole, do you want to maybe kick that off? Sure. So we do have a number of pre-K programs in Maine that offer their programming with a partner. So ultimately, that means that the public pre-K program, the curriculum, the assessment is all being provided in partnership with a community provider. So for example, a number of those are Head Starts. Um, so Head Start will work with the local school department to provide pre-K programming for four-year-olds, as opposed to, we did mention um, having a relationship, for example, with child development services for our Part B 619 services for students who may have developmental delays or an IEP in place. The, the difference there is the relationship with CDS is so that they can provide services for students, whereas the partnership with Head Start is actually providing programming um, in tandem, in partnership with the school district, as opposed to just the school district providing um, all aspects of the programming. So it's done in um, a variety of ways. Some folks will um, share responsibilities over staffing. Some folks will include curriculum and assessment. Um, in some areas, the pre-K programming is housed at the partner's site. Um, th there's a variety of examples throughout Maine, um, but feel free, I know Nina or, or Marcy, anybody else to add on to that if that wasn't very clear. And in, in addition to Head Start programming, you may also find um, partnerships with a um, licensed childcare provider in the community. Um, you could find it if a, let's say a um, YMCA or a Boys and Girls Club had a licensed um, pre-K program or childcare program and wanted to um, become a partner, it might be the case that you would offer the, the programming right at that site. But the responsibility for all of those pieces of the programming will be happening um, with the partner um, and the SAU working collaboratively. I would also uh, just family child care centers or family child care homes as well. Um, I don't believe there are any current partnerships yet, but we're hoping. <laughs> Nicole and Jane, I wonder if while we're waiting, if you would mind just popping those links to the RFA um, packet and to the amendment in the chat box one more time for anyone who came in a little bit late to the session, because I know that that won't appear in the chat box as easily. We're certainly happy to stay on a little bit longer if anyone has a, an additional question, but if you are all set and have all the information that you need, feel free to jump off. Um, we're certainly looking forward to receiving applications and excited to work with um, all applicants um, and certainly um, excited about expansion of public pre-K in our state.
And this is a wonderful opportunity to work towards that.